You would think, with WrestleMania 32 being a little bit over a month away, you would think, with the WWE wanting to get more than 100,000 people to show up to said WrestleMania 32 event at that magnificent shrine to Jerry Jones' ego that is AT&T Stadium, you would think that the WWE, on their last stop to WrestleMania, with all of these factors being considered, would want to make sure that they're on their game and they're on point as much as they possibly can be. You would think. You would think. But instead of getting an on-point show that delivered in multiple capacities in multiple ways and really set the table nicely for that final kind of pivotal turning point on the road to WrestleMania, instead, what we got was a ridiculously bad, on so many different levels, fast lane show. Full of logic fails that ultimately just ended up being a massive waste of time. I can't tell you, during the three hours of watching this show tonight, or the close to three hours since the show ended at like 10.45, bad habit that they have, I can't remember the last time that I had to fight sleep so much watching a WWE pay-per-view. And in fact, several times throughout the show, I caught myself nodding off for a moment or two, or sometimes maybe even a couple of more than that. Just terrible. And all the while, and all the while, all of us as fans were reaching for something. Reaching for something. And lo and behold, the WWE is ultimately teaching us something. And we're not exactly liking the curriculum and the lesson plan of which we are expected to learn from. This was bad. I ain't about to sit here and go through all the matches and all this other crap. Because it most certainly wasn't worth it. I've got two primary themes that I've already touched on once. I'm going to keep touching on them throughout the course of this review or whatever the hell you want to call it. I'm going to talk about the massive logic fails that so perfectly epitomize the WWE product of today. And if that's not it, part two of this... We'll talk about how this was ultimately just one gigantic waste of time. And if what I talked about in terms of logic fails don't perfectly epitomize the WWE product today, just how much this company goes out of its way to ultimately be one gigantic waste of time, and in particular one gigantic waste of our time, is truly the epitome of WWE today. If you want to call this show anything... I suppose hashtag WWE failing would get the freaking job done. Now let's start off with the logic fails because this show was just chock full of logic fail goodness. For example, for example, somebody in the back decided that it would be a good idea that instead of taking a two out of three falls U.S. title match featuring ADR and Kalisto, that actually had a little bit of a story to it and a little bit of a purpose to it and putting that on the main show. No, no, no. Instead, we would have an R-Truth versus Curtis Axel match on this fucking pay-per-view to advance a Raw storyline with Goldust wanting R-Truth to be his fucking tag team partner. The fuck? You took a quality match in the U.S. title match and kicked it to the pre-show for our truth versus Curtis fucking Axel to advance a story between our truth and fucking Goldust, who even knows if these two guys have any type of featured role at WrestleMania 32. I bet they don't. The Deadly Boy has recently made a somewhat significant character change, and you would think on this show you would want to utilize them in some way, follow up on that in some way, emphasize that in some way, do something with it. But instead of something like that, we get a cutting edge peep show where you've got the New Day. But then they're interrupted by the League of Nations, and we take this golden opportunity to perhaps build up to a TLC tag title match at WrestleMania 32, where you've got Edge and Christian, you've got the Dudley Boys on the roster, two-thirds of that classic match at WrestleMania 17 right there. What better way to logically bridge the gap to that moment 
You bring out the New Day, maybe you bring out the Usos, and bam, magic can fucking happen. Instead, you give us several minutes of a waste of epic fucking time, especially precious pay-per-view time, not to plug something involving WrestleMania 32, but to plug the goddamn Edge and Christian WWE Network show. You use several minutes of the pay-per-view to not tie into your biggest show of the year where you're trying to sell out more 100,000 seats. Instead, you use several minutes of your pay-per-view to plug some stupid-ass WWE Network show that was going to debut after the fucking pay-per-view. Seriously, I can't make this shit up because it's true. The Divas tag that kicked off the show between Team Bad and Becky and Sasha, at least they gave him some time to actually work a tag team match. It wasn't just thrown out there and da-da-da. But even this is filled with logic holes. For Christ's sakes, Tamina is supposed to be the biggest, baddest bitch out of all of them. Why in the fuck is she running away in any way, shape, or form from the smallest of the divas in the match of freaking Sasha Banks? Did that bother anybody fucking else? Furthermore, we get to this whole thing. Never mind that at the Royal Rumble, Sasha Banks threw Becky Lynch out of the ring and they don't get along. Oh, they're coming together because they want to win this match. So after they win this match, you've got Sasha and Becky raising each other's arms and neither one of them goes after the other person. How does that make any fucking sense at all? Divas revolution my ass. This is the same type of nonsensical bullshit booking that we've gotten out of the WWE when it comes to this God-blessed division for fucking years. And sticking with the theme of the fail logic of the WWE Divas division, let's take a look at the Divas title match. Now, never mind the fact that a little while back, it was supposed to be a big deal that Paige had used Reed Flair's death in a promo against Charlotte, and everybody's all upset about this crap, to where now Charlotte is knocking freaking Brie Bella because of her sister's injury and Daniel Bryan's retirement and saying all these stupid fucking things. Even getting to the whole premise of this match here, Brie Bella goes to from being, excuse me, a jobbing heel bitch to all of a sudden now because her sister got a neck injury and her husband had to retire, now she's supposed to be a freaking baby face who had already beaten freaking Charlotte, by the way. And now all of a sudden we're supposed to get behind her and cheer in this fucking Divas title shot. Oh, give me a fucking break. Speaking of fails in general and logic fails in particular, let's get to the good old boy Dolph Ziggler. Because man, just so many things about him just reek of epic fucking failure. Period. I'll leave it to my girlfriend, Ashley, who's sitting there and trying her best to stay awake watching this pay-per-view tonight. She sees Dolph Ziggler on the TV, and she opines so eloquently about his choice of hairstyles for the evening that, you know, I don't know who the hell told him to wear twisties on his head, but he looks suspect as fucking shit. I used to wear twisties back when I was in middle school. Now, mind you, this is my lady saying it, not me. She said, and I quote, he looks suspect because he was wearing twisties. She didn't know who the fuck told him it was a good idea to rock that shit. And she used to rock it as a middle school girl. And then she also so eloquently stated her exact thoughts about Dolph Ziggler as such. He tries so hard to be badass Billy Gunn. Technically, does fewer suspect things than Billy Gunn used to do, yet is so much more suspect than badass Billy Gunn, or Mr. Ass as he used to be called, or when he was a part of Chuck and Billy. And she's right! Everything about this guy is just a fucking fail. I can't wait for this guy to go the fuck away. <laughs> fuck Dolph Ziggler! But in general, the whole premise of this IC title match between Dolph Ziggler and Kevin Owens was also a fucking waste of fucking time and a big time logic fail. So let me get this straight. Kevin Owens has the IC title. Then he loses it to Dean Ambrose. So that way, all of a sudden, for a couple of weeks, after beating Dolph Ziggler so many umpteen dozen fucking times, now Dolph Ziggler starts to beat him and Kevin Owens can't beat the jackass. 
So that way, Kevin Owens comes on Raw last week, wins the Fatal Five Way, gets the IC title back for whatever the fuck reason, just so that way he can take on the guy who's fucking beaten him a couple of times now after losing to him so many times before that. So now you get to this pay-per-view, and Kevin Owens is beating fucking Dolph Ziggler in Dolph Ziggler's hometown area. I can't make this shit up! So in one month's time, we have gone, in one month's time, from the Wyatt family eliminating Brock Lesnar from the 2016 Royal Rumble, people envisioning it's going to be Bray Wyatt versus Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania, and they're even being scuttlebutt about there being a potential Braun Strowman versus Undertaker match at said WrestleMania, to now here at WWE Fastlane, the Wyatt family is jobbing out in a six-man tag match to Team Big Kane back. Just think about this for the second and how ridiculous that is. You do all these stupid things with the fucking Wyatt family, and then they almost always fucking lose. Why the hell would anybody care? Why would anybody take them goddamn seriously ever again? Why would you have wasted so much on them in trying to build them up for the Royal Rumble, having them do with the Royal Rumble what they did, just to sit here and come and fucking job a goddamn fast lane? You know what? I don't know if I'm the only one who notices this or observes this. But you notice how they were referencing this team of Big Show and Kane and Ryback as being WWE's Titans? It's almost like, to me, the WWE, in a way, is still fighting the Monday Night War, and here's what I mean. It's almost like Big Show, Kane, Ryback, they're called the WWE's Titans because they represent Titan Towers. And it's almost like the Wyatt family, in a lot of ways, represents many of the southern wrestling stereotypes that Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn and others within the upper echelon of the WWE have had for many, many years. And as a result, they look at the Wyatt family as WCW. They look at it as uh, Turner Broadcasting. So, of course, at the end of the day, Titan Towers have got to reign and rule supreme over Tad Turner's little southern wrestling company. If you look a little deeper and you really think about it, that's the only thing I could think of. Because otherwise, this made absolutely no fucking sense at all. And of course, in a show that was clearly lacking for highlights or good things, one of the few things you got was this third match between AJ Styles and Chris Jericho. But even this, at this point in time, is a huge logic fail in and of itself because of the decision to go to this so goddamn soon. You're bringing AJ Styles in at the Royal Rumble. The Miz is like that perfect handshake introductory feud for him that could have culminated here at Fastlane. You could make AJ Styles versus Chris Jericho mean a little something at WrestleMania 32. It could have an element of specialness to us, especially since they had never wrestled before that anybody had seen. And now they could go to WrestleMania 32, and at a time in an era where we so rarely get organically original and new fresh matchups, here's one of them. Just two guys going out there. Who's a fucking better man? But no, of course, the WWE just can't help themselves. Fools fucking rush in. They give you the match, the Raw after the Royal Rumble. Then they give you the match on SmackDown. And here we come once again. We've already got a third fucking match between the two of these assholes at Fastlane. And for all you knuckleheads that sit there and talk about, well, I don't mind a best of five or a best of seven series out of these guys. Get over this lame ass. Wrestling is fucking awesome all the time. And all that matters is the in-ring action bullshit. Be different if you were actually building this up as a best of five or a best of seven series, but you're not. It's just another perfect representation of how the WWE takes something that could potentially be good and fucking ruins it because they can't help themselves and they just rush right in because they don't plan out anything long term and frankly they don't have any plans for the short term either. But when it comes to logic fails pertaining to this event of WWE Fastlane and the WWE as a whole at this moment on the road to WrestleMania 32, you've got to look at this main event match. Now, I'm sure people are going to sit there, and some probably liked it. They thought Brock was cool. They thought Ambrose was very good. And they were pissed about Roman Reigns winning. Yeah, yeah, whatever. 
To me, though, the whole premise of this match was fucking stupid. So many things about how this was done were fucking stupid. So many things about how this was set up was fucking stupid. And so many things about how this was executed and the finish that we got was ultimately fucking stupid. The fail of logic fails on this entire goddamn show was this crappy ass main event. And I'll start off with the Brock Lesnar perspective. I've had so many problems with the premise of Brock Lesnar getting this number one contender shot here at WWE Fastlane because it just makes absolutely no fucking sense from a storyline standpoint, a kayfabe standpoint, if you will, on so many different goddamn levels. First and foremost, if you are Triple H, if you are the authority, you want that title because you feel title equals power. The number one threat on the entire roster today to take said title from you is Brock fucking Lesnar, the same guy who ended The Undertaker's undefeated streak at WrestleMania 30. The same Undertaker that Triple H got himself in three chances at 17, 27, and 28, couldn't get the job done, including at 28, in a Hell in a Cell match where his best bud, HBK, was a fucking guest referee. Brock Lesnar did what Triple H couldn't do three times. The same Brock Lesnar that beat Triple H two out of three times, including breaking his arm back at SummerSlam, if you remember going back that far. So, so hold on. So we're going to sit there and say, I love having the title. Glad we fucked Roman out of it. Want to keep the title. So let me just give Brock Lesnar a fucking chance to become the number one contender so that way I go on to face him at WrestleMania 32, the biggest beast of all in the company, the biggest threat of all. And then once we get to the fact that this is announced and how stupid it is, he's clearly the number one threat. Nobody disputes this. Look at the motherfucker. Look at what he's done. Look at who he is. Look at what he's done in amateur wrestling ranks, in UFC ranks, in the professional wrestling ranks. Clearly the number one target, the number one threat. Yet the authority throughout the entire post-Rumble build-up to Fastlane has focused all of their energies on Roman Reigns' end and as a byproduct, Dean Ambrose, and has let Brock Lesnar go completely on fucking scathe. Not one beatdown orchestrated by the authority, not one raw or smackdown match for a Brock fucking Lesnar, just consistently putting him in situations where he doesn't have to do any fucking thing. What sense does that make? And furthermore, when talking about the whole thing in terms of Brock Lesnar and his character, what was the point of having him end the streak at WrestleMania 30 if he wasn't going to put the next generation over, if he wasn't going to help the next generation out? You do not end the fucking streak that you have invested over two decades into to create fucking Suplex Cena. Ultimately, though, that is exactly what this fucking company has created. It's Suplex Cena. Let's call it as we exactly fucking see it. With fewer moves, less personality, less charisma, and less skills on the mic. But for some reason, people love fucking Brock Lesnar. I know why. I'll get to that in a second. But Jesus Christ. The WWE goes more out of their way to protect Brock Lesnar in their booking than it seems like they even do it with John Cena on their best days. They've created another Cena monster. Now it's Suplex Cena. So even when he doesn't win, he doesn't lose. What the fuck was the point of ending the streak if Brock Lesnar was never going to put anybody goddamn over? But we get to the whole real reason that people love Brock Lesnar. And will make all types of excuses, even though it flies in the face of so many logics that people put out there over the years. It's because Paul Heyman is with them. Well, let me ask you this again from a purely storyline, K Fabe standpoint. What the fuck is Paul Heyman worth if Brock Lesnar is in this match, knowing from the beginning, from the jump, from the outset, that his guy is going in with a two on one disadvantage. He's outmanned and he's outgunned. Beast my ass nothing. Those numbers matter at the end of the fucking day. How stupid is he fucking look in a triple threat match that, by the way, is no disqualification. So you can do whatever the fuck you want. How stupid is it look for Paul Heyman to not gotten his client some fucking insurance? 
Why not hire the League of Nations to sit there and take out Dean Ambrose and or Roman Reigns? Why not bring in a new client, somebody that can have Brock Lesnar's back to even up the fucking odds? Why not hire two fucking mercenaries so that way you can make it three on two and Brock Lesnar and these two new hired guns, these two mercenaries can beat the shit out of Ambrose and Reigns and on goes Brock Lesnar to win the title for fucking Triple H at WrestleMania 32. Just the whole premise of so many things pertaining to Brock Lesnar right now are complete fucking epic logic fails. But when it comes to Dean Ambrose, the authority, Triple H, they don't like him either. They might not quite harbor the same level of distaste for him as they do, let's say, a Roman Reigns, but he's still not somebody they're inviting to breakfast on Sunday, you know, the breakfast club, all that other shebangabang. But yet, here we go. We're giving him an opportunity to potentially main event WrestleMania 32 and get a shot at Triple H's fucking WWE World Heavyweight Championship. If I didn't like a guy and I'm in charge, I'm going to do everything I possibly can to fucking bury the asshole to make sure that he is as far away as possible from ever achieving that pinnacle of what he could be. This makes no sense in a real corporate environment if the boss doesn't like the underling, the boss buries or fires said underling. But in the WWE, especially when it comes to the ridiculousness of the authority, they don't bury him, they fucking elevate him. So they put him in a position to do the thing that they don't want to have happen and then they act surprised like if, when it happens. And then they do it again. And the same thing happens and they do it again. If we're talking about this from a football standpoint, I expect this out of the fucking Cleveland skid marks. How appropriate I tied it into the location of where this pay-per-view was this evening. I'd expect that lunacy. I wouldn't expect it from the authority of WWE. But furthermore, we get to Ambrose. Let's talk about lunacy. The lunatic fringe, lunatic this, lunatic that. Oh, lunatic blowing out your fucking ass. Wash your ass, Ambrose. Furthermore. But the whole deal, this guy's supposed to be a lunatic. He's supposed to be unhinged. He's supposed to be all over the fucking place. Kind of a brawl for all street fighter type of dude. Anything freaking goes. So you're in a triple threat match where there are no disqualifications. There are no countouts. You could basically do whatever you fucking want. That is one of the premises of the goddamn match. And all the while, we wait until the very, very end, the climax, to start really using weapons. Now, I'm sure you'll sit there and argue they were putting Brock Lesnar through multiple tables. But I'm talking about chairs. I'm talking about this type of shit. Ambrose didn't start using it until the very fucking end. If you're Ambrose, you know you're the underdog going into it. Because you know straight up man-man in a real fight, you're probably not whooping Roman Reigns' ass. And you most certainly know in no way, shape, or form are you whooping Brock Lesnar's ass. You've got to find an equalizer. You've got to find something that could level the playing field for you. Perhaps give you a built-in advantage. If you're Dean Ambrose, you've got to use your smarts. If you don't have the bronze, you most certainly got to have the freaking brains. Go get some fucking weapons from the very beginning. Get chairs. Get freaking barbed wire baseball bats and flaming shards of glass and throw them on freaking tables filled with 30 fucking cubic feet of goddamn razor wire. And he waited until the very end to do any of it. That's why these characters don't get fucking over, because you put them in clear-cut situations where their character should be doing something that makes all the sense in the world because of the stipulation of the goddamn match. And we don't fucking do it. I'm sure many out there are pissed off at what happened in this main event. That Roman Reigns was even in this spot to begin with. And ultimately you knew where this shit was going from the very beginning. You know how this song and dance was going to play out. And you're pissed as hell because Roman Reigns won. That's what you're pissed off about. Roman Reigns won. Lesnar or Ambrose fucking did it. And you're pissed off about it. Maybe you're pissed off because you see the Super Cena 2.0 that is to come and you're dreading it and you're saying after all of these years of Cena, why would we want another decade of another fucking Cena type and somebody with less personality, less charisma, and less ability to talk on the microphone and frankly not as good of a worker in the ring either, understandably to a degree. Some of you are pissed off because Dean Ambrose or Brock Lesnar didn't win. Again, maybe understandably, but the story pointed to Roman Reigns winning here. It clearly did. 
You, you, that's where they had to go. I think some of you carry a deep-seated resentment towards Roman Reigns because he won the 2015 Royal Rumble and your boy Daniel Bryan didn't. I think part of that is true. I think in general it's just a representation of how you feel the WWE is out of touch, out of touch with reality, out of touch with you. And as a result, you make Roman Reigns your punching bag. And I think to a certain degree, no matter what Roman Reigns ever did or didn't do that could actually get him over or not get him over, He's behind the eight ball the entire time. Turning him heel is not the fucking answer because you'll poon all over that. Trying to push him as a babyface, especially in the way that WWE is idiotically doing it, is not getting the job done fucking either. To me, though, to me, though, we're focusing on the one wrong things when it comes to being pissed off about Roman Reigns winning. When it comes to logic fails of this show, and even the biggest logic fail of all, which was the entire premise of for this number one contenders match at Fastlane. The biggest logic fail of all was that Roman Reigns was even in this fucking spot to begin with. This is the ridiculousness of the WWE. This shows me just how little Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn and others involved with the higher reaches of the creative process of WWE. Think about our ability to understand what is good storytelling or, or not. This speaks to their respect, or in this case, lack of respect for our intelligence and for our taste and so many other things. And for basic understanding of what we're sold as a bill of goods 99 out of 100 times. The first problem with the whole premise of Roman Reigns being in this match is the fact that, correct me if I'm wrong, but he was the champion heading into the 2016 Royal Rumble. Yes, he lost his belt. Praise God! But at the end of the day... Isn't a fundamental premise of being the champion that once you inevitably lose that championship belt, you get a rematch? It's like contractually guaranteed, isn't it? Now you might say, well, you're looking too deeply into us. Except for the fact that this is the premise of so many things that they do in follow-up pay-per-views after a title change, or even the following night on Raw after a pay-per-view title change. They do it all the fucking time. This is a basically understood fundamental premise of being a champion and a fundamental premise of a fucking product. But all the while, we have put Roman Reigns into this situation where he's trying to get a title shot that he already fucking has. So why the hell would he need to be in this goddamn match to begin with? And furthermore, what the fuck would it matter whether he won or lost this goddamn match? Because at the end of the day, he still has a title shot at fucking WrestleMania if he wants it. Because he was the champion. He lost the belt. He hasn't gotten his rematch yet. He gets a rematch. So the fuck would you even waste your time putting this match out there? Holy Christ. I, and furthermore, furthermore. If you're going to sit there and ignore so much logic that you've used for so many years as basic premises for rematches on Raws and the pay-per-views that follow, let's say you're arguing that, hey, because we're the authority, we change the rules for Roman Reigns. Fuck him. He doesn't have a title shot. He doesn't have a guaranteed rematch clause in his contract, by the way, which you would think would have been something that would have been handled before the Royal Rumble, but nonetheless. So if Roman Reigns doesn't have a title shot, and the whole premise of the Royal Rumble was to get the title off of him, then why the fuck would you give him a shot to get a shot to get that fucking belt back to begin with? Am I the only one here that sees the fucking problem with this whole entire fucking premise? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. And all the while, Roman is a threat. He's not a Brock Lesnar type of threat, but he most certainly is a fucking threat. You know, a two-time world heavyweight champion. A guy that's eliminated the most men in a single rumble in history. A guy that went almost the full distance in 2014, being the final two in the Royal Rumble, to 2015 he fucking won it, to even now in 2016 he still ended up being... Goddamn the third to last person in the goddamn Rumble after he had started off at number one, beating all types of people along the way, but yet the authority and Triple H do absolutely nothing at this fucking night, at this fucking event, in this fucking match to try and fuck him up and take him out of the equation. Does that make any fucking sense whatsoever? If anything, if I'm Triple H and I'm the authority, I don't want to lose that title. I don't even want to set up a fucking title match at this point. 
I'm going to take Brock Lesnar out. I'm going to take Dean Ambrose out. I'm going to take fucking Roman Reigns out. I'll let the social outcast fight it out amongst the four of them fucks to see who's going to take on God at WrestleMania 32 for the title. And if you were the champion, you would do the same fucking thing. But now all the while, we went from at the Royal Rumble to where it was one versus all. And that's what it finally took for fucking Roman Reigns to lose the belt, even though it was ultimately God having to come in at number 30 and save the day. So now we're going to WrestleMania 30, and it's one versus God. And I have to get all biblical about this shit and everything else, and I'm not going to. The whole premise of this is so fucking stupid. And everything about this is freaking stupid. And it ultimately comes to the biggest point of all is that so many things involving the WWE product today and what they do are just one epic waste of time. And that's exactly what this show was, was an epic waste of your fucking time and my fucking time. And that's ultimately what it is. One giant waste of time. This show was, this product in general is, when you fundamentally break it down, we look for reasons and justifications to continue to support the brand, continue to support and watch the product. But it really truly is one incredibly ginormous, epic waste of time. And if you don't agree, ding dong, dumb dicks, you're wrong. I don't know what in the bluest of blue fucks you could possibly see that would lead you to any conclusion other than this. All types of fucking 50-50 booking where nobody ever gets any momentum, nobody ever truly gets over, and then every once in a while when somebody can persevere over the shit pile that is WWE and their booking philosophies and creative strategies, the company will do everything they can to wrestle away momentum from those guys and put them down every chance they can, especially at big moments. You get too few storylines that suck, and almost none of them ever really engage the fans in a meaningful or purposeful way. You use pay-per-view time to not plug your next show, which is your biggest show of the year, but to plug a new comedy sketch show on the WWE Network. You get so much wrestling on Raw that it's only natural that the pay-per-view matches don't feel special. As a result, so many of these matches we see are matches of Raw, but not pay-per-view quality. The WWE will do everything that they can to take their golden boy, their Superman, and try to push him like an underdog, all the while making sure that he always comes out looking strong and always gets the upper hand. And then you get the big climactic moment, a main event finish, that's predictable and falls flat on its fucking face. And the whole premise of everything that they do from a logic standpoint, from a storyline standpoint, makes no fucking sense whatsoever if grounded in any reality in any way, shape, or form. Did I perfectly epitomize what WWE Fastlane 2016 was? Or the WWE product in general with those statements? The flat-out answer is both. You're heading into the biggest show of the year where you are going to try and put more than 100,000 people into the venue. You're going to try and break the WrestleMania 3 record. You know deep down Vince wants to break the North American indoor sporting event attendance record. He wants to do that. And this was your salvo towards doing that. This was your big public offering a little over a month beforehand, this is how you decided you wanted to set up the table for that? If you're not praying to God already, you should be praying to God because at this point in time, I'm not even sure God can save this shitstorm that's shaping up that we're going to call WrestleMania 32.